Okay, I, I, I'm all, I can kind of follow you, Robbie, up to this point. But what about the abomination of desolation? Let's go there. Do you really think the abomination of desolation already happened? And the answer is yes, because it's inside that inclusio. Look at verse 15. This is the abomination. And for years, we've, we've thought this is like the, during the tribulation, that horrible time when abomination of desolation. By, by the way, I don't have time for this, but I'll say it anyway. I probably shouldn't say that. We will never finish the sermon. Just, we'll never finish. Sorry, that's the Holy Spirit saying goodbye. Okay, verse 15. It's about the temple. We'll get, we'll get believe me, every question you have, I'm gonna try to answer in, over the next three years. Okay, verse 15. <laughs> I mean, literally, I thought I was going to be, ask Robert, I thought we were going to be in and out by the summer, maybe the fall. No. Okay. Verse 15. Okay. So, <laughs> we might, yeah. so when you see the abomination of desolation, that's a horrible thing, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place. And then we have this parenthetical, I'm going to suggest it, it's a scribal insert. That's why it's in parentheses. Don't let that bother you. That says, let the reader understand. What, 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 they're, what Jesus is saying, possibly, or what the scribe's saying, you know this stuff. It's not a surprise, you know this, you know this stuff. Then when this happens, those in, get this, Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. What is he saying here? When this happens, run for your life, right? Like it's going to get bad. Now, if you're like me, I was taught this is some future catastrophic cataclysmic event that's gonna happen right before the end of the world. Now, we already know that's not the case, why? Because Jesus is answering a question the disciples posed about what? When is what? The temple going to be destroyed? Now, I know what you're saying. I'm not too convinced. Well, let's listen to what Luke says because Luke helps us here. Luke is a contemporary of Matthew writing a gospel, same accounts from different perspectives. Watch how Luke helps us here. Luke chapter 20, go back, I think it's 22. 22, 21, I'll pull one. 21, verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, what he's saying is when the Roman army comes around the city, recognize that it's the desolation that has come near. So he, he gives us contextual, and look at the next thing. Then those in Judea, when you see this, Flee to the mountains. Those inside the city, leave it. Those who are in the country must not enter it because these are days of vengeance to fulfill all the things that are written. So here's what Luke tells us. When the desolation, abomination of desolation is when the Roman army surrounds the city. When you see that, get out. Notice what he's not saying, with all due respect. He's not telling modern day American Christians to build bunkers in the ground, to get your gas mask ready, to store up six months of food for a coming apocalyptic uh, Armageddon that's gonna take place on earth. And so burrow yourself underground and wait. I promise you, he's not saying that at all. Here's what he's warning those people to do in that generation. When you see this, run for your life. Run for the hills of Judea. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Get out right there. Don't even go back. It's comical, but, but I wanna say this. Jesus cannot, you would agree, he cannot be envisioning a group of Western Christians, when they hear about the tribulation, booking tickets to Israel so that they can, when the tribulation arrives, hide in the hills of Judea. Really? I mean, I say that jokingly. Y'all okay? Everybody okay? <laughs> I say that as a joke, but, but, but listen, listen, it's simple, right? It's simple. Jesus is giving a command geographically to a group of people who understood it perfectly. Now, here's the million-dollar question. Did that really happen? Did it happen? And the answer is absolutely. Josephus is our friend. If you want to go back and, in fact, I would take the book, uh, the, the, the writings of Josephus, if you're interested, and take Matthew 24 and even Revelation when we get there, and you could see all these events happen. Josephus is a first century Jewish turncoat. He's a Jewish man by birth, turns on the nation, works for the Roman army so he could save his life and becomes a historian as an eyewitness to everything in the first century. So he was there. Here's what he said about this. 
All hope of escaping the city was now cut off from the Jews. Together with their liberty of going out of the city, then did the famine widen its progress and devoured the people by whole houses and families. Whole families died. The upper rooms were full of children and women that were dying by famine, and the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also, and the young men, wandered about the marketplace like shadows, all swelled with the famine and fell down dead wheresoever their misery, misery seized them. Horrific. I mean, I could tell you story after story. I read just, just painstakingly going through this. Women, one woman killed her own child because she didn't want to surrender to the Romans, boiled it and ate it. I mean, that's the kind of stuff. Is that the abomination of death? Absolutely. And then in verse 21, Jesus says this, and this is the promise. Jesus says, there will never be, for, for at that time, there will be great distress. Now the CSB soft plays this word. The word here is tribulation, write it in your Bible. The word here is tribulation, the King James Version. There will be this great tribulation, where we get this. The kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now. And here's the line that got, this right here changed my whole perspective, by the way, this line right here. A tribulation that's coming to the earth, the destruction of the temple, that has never taken place from the beginning of the world until now, and what? Never will again. And then he says, here's how it's gonna work. Luke, look at verse 30. Or verse 29, immediately after the tribulation is over of the temple, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not shed its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky or the clouds. And then all of the peoples of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the what? Clouds, we already know what that means, of heaven with power and great glory. Both Matthew and Luke said, Jesus is gonna come that day on the clouds with power and great glory. Now we already know what that means from two weeks ago. When it says Jesus comes on the clouds, Second Thessalonians chapter four, what does it mean? Is he crowd surfing like, like, like on a surfboard? Is, is, he, ride, is he skiing on, on the slopes of, of, of public, no. It's a picture, symbolically, follow me, of judgment. And I know what you're thinking, but what about, the, what about the sun? What about the star? I mean, the Bible clearly says the stars will fall from the sky. The Bible clearly says the moon will not shine. So what, 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 do, you, what do you do with that? Well, the answer is that is symbolic, apocalyptic language. I'm gonna show you, I can show you more, but I'm gonna show you for time two See, that's the hardest part each week of the sermon. How much do I have to show you to prove that, I'm not making this up, <laughs> I wish we need two hours, but I'm just gonna give you two, but I can give you more. I'm gonna show you two examples in the Old Testament where God uses this language verbatim for judgment. The first one is Ezekiel talks about God's judgment against Egypt back then. This is what's gonna happen. Watch this, Ezekiel 32, seven, look it up later. When I snuff you out, Egypt, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, make it go dark, and the moon will not give its light. I will darken all the shining lights in heaven over you and will bring darkness over your land. This is the declaration of the Lord. Let me give you another one. Isaiah speaking about the judgment that's coming on Babylon, verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 10. Indeed, the stars of the sky and the constellations will not give their what? Light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will... They're not saying that the star, like we've always been, like the stars are gonna fall on us and the sun's gonna, it's symbolic apocalyptic language. Now, did it happen? Absolutely. According to Josephus, when the Roman army invaded Jerusalem and took over the temple, guess how many Jews died in that siege? And by the way, you're gonna love this, don't wanna give it away, but guess how long the siege, siege was? Exactly three and a half years, but I'll let, we'll learn that soon. Three and a half years. One million Jews died, 97,000 were taken, 
taken captive. They're made a laughing stock uh, of, the, of the community. They, they, they laughed at them. They, they, they made a carnival scene of them. And then Jesus says, this is the great tribulation. There will never be another what? Tribulation like this again. So the question is, is Jesus telling the truth? Because at first you may say, well, well what, about the, what about the Holocaust? Like surely that was greater than this. And it was in death. Six million Jews, one million uh, died um, in, in the destruction of the temple. But Jesus' point is not about scope of death. When Jesus says there'll never be a tribulation like this, he's talking about the significance of the impact. Because there were a lot of people died in World War I, World War II, the uh, Vietnam War, Vietnam. I mean, you put all those together, Korean War, they're all put together. Jesus is talking about the scope of the death, no, not the scope of the death, but the significance of the impact it caused in the nation. Here's why. They could not fathom a temple not standing in the first century. You're gonna realize, here's a video I wanna show you. The temple, according to many people back then, was one of the wonders of the world. Some called it the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, one, one scholar said, one rabbi in the Mishnah said, he who has not seen the temple has not seen one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Jewish life centered around the temple. It was the epicenter of everything. Every festival you went to, you went there to the temple. Every time you offered a sacrifice at the temple, forgiveness of sin at the temple, uh, you being pardoned from your iniquity at the temple. That's how you connected with God. That's how you prayed. That's how you sought the presence of God. That's where heaven and earth met. To lose the temple, don't miss this, you lose everything. You lose history, you lose your heritage, you lose your identity. I don't know any way to compare it closely, but if you lived in Dallas, Texas, imagine not having the Cowboys, America's team, right? I mean, that'd be a tragedy, right? Or imagine America without a, without a White House. Well, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> let me bring it close to home. Imagine living in the South without Chick-fil-A. I mean, it's just, it's inconceivable, right? Like, like you can't conceive a world without these things. And, and, and you're probably saying it this way. Well, why did you spend so long in this? Why, why, why did you belabor the point for the tribulation? We're not even in Revelation. Here's, I'm gonna show my cards again. Let me show you something. I had to go back before we can go forward. Why? Because we're gonna see now in light of Jesus and John and the first century audience in that century, we're gonna see that the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, most of them, I'll say one through six, you ready for this, brace yourself, already happened. 